All right, we're up and running again. So I wanted to talk about motivation. Whoops, let me just uh, hide the floating meeting controls. Okay, so we spent a lot of time talking about system one and system two. We spent a lot of time talking about cognitive biases and heuristics uh, and self-control. And the big issue seems to be that when we're in a situation that lets us make, uh, lets us operate with fewer cognitive distractions, uh, when we're in a situation uh, that uh, maximizes our ability to uh, make quick and easy decisions, we tend to do that. Uh, with time and effort and with control, uh, we can make uh, more complex decisions by engaging system two. Let's look at motivation. Uh, motivation, you're familiar with the idea of being motivated to do something. Uh, there are intrinsic and extrinsic forms of motivation. Uh, intrinsic forms of motivation are the kinds of things that mean that uh, you're motivated to do something because you're personally interested in it. Most of us have very little uh, difficulty staying on task when it's something that we have intrinsic motivation in. If you're interested in a course or interested in a, in a show or something like that, you can stay focused on it. Uh, extrinsic motivation uh, is when you're required to do something. So most of us, if we're in an employment situation, uh, we're asked to do something. It's not necessarily something we love to do, but it's part of our job. Uh, that is a different kind of motivation. Uh, so extrinsic is put on you by the, by the system or by the situation or uh, by a, an employer or whatever. Intrinsic is because you're intrinsically interested uh, in spending time doing something. Um, motivation has other characteristics to it though. There are different goals that we have uh, that tie into motivation. So I'm going to run through several different topics here dealing with approach and avoidance, with regulatory goals, regulatory focus, and then an idea known as regulatory fit. Uh, and I understand that this is, this could be a little bit uh, complicated because we're talking about focus and fit. Uh, so to sort of provide some broader context, when I'm referring to a fit, I'm referring to when your motivational focus matches uh, the, the intrinsic des design of an environment that you're in. In other words, if you're in a situation where uh, approaching or gain, you know, achieving gains is uh, important and you have a focus that tends to also like achieving gains, you're gonna, you're gonna notice some degree of fit. Fit, in this case, will reduce the cognitive demands of the task. In other words, you'll feel like you're in the right situation. Uh, you'll feel like you're in the right scenario. If you're in a mismatch, if you're in a, in a context or a job or a scenario that maximizes achieving goals, but you tend to be risk avoidant, you tend to be someone who is naturally uh, avoidant or tends to naturally want to avoid losing something, uh, or just by virtue of uh, maybe a recent event or a recent scenario, you tend to be avoidant, there's going to be a mismatch. And if there's a regulatory mismatch where your frame of mind doesn't fit with the organization or the orientation of the task or the condition that you're in, uh, then it's going to be more cognitively demanding. Uh, you may not realize it, you may not notice it or be able to put a label on it, but there'll be some additional resources because your frame of mind doesn't fit the frame of mind of the task or the environment that you're in. And sometimes that happens. Now, most of the time we don't notice when it happens. We just feel like we're doing well in something or not doing well in something. So we're gonna talk about is some research that's tried to create scenarios that maximize gains, maximize avoidance of loss, uh, and then also tend, uh, can manipulate people's focus and whether or not this fit uh, plays a role and then how it plays into thinking, at which point we'll then move on to uh, mood effects uh, in the second half. So let's define some terms here. An approach goal, any task that has an approach goal are desirable states that one wants to move forward and attain. Uh, so anytime that there's something you want to get, whether it is uh, a good mark in this class or uh, you're looking to get a you know, get hired at a, a, a summer research position, uh, or you're looking to get hired at a firm. Uh, anything that's at a, a goal that you would like to approach and attain, and that's different from an avoidance, which are undesirable states that one wants to avoid. Uh, we face both of these things all the time. There are things we want, and there's things we want to avoid. 
uh, and the playoff between these two uh, can uh, interact with uh, our cognitive style. These goals often interact with a cognitive style known as regulatory focus. So we've got goals, approach goals, gains, and avoidance goals, which means avoiding loss. And now we're going to talk about a cognitive style known as your regulatory focus. In other words, how do you tend to regulate your behavior? You could have a promotion focus. In other words, a focus on the achievement of desired outcomes and possible gains or non-gains in the environment. So all things being equal, you might be the kind of person or might be in the kind of situation. So this can be a trait or a state uh, that is focused on gaining things, focused on promotion. Uh, you tend to look to see what you can maximize and what you can achieve. Uh, or you may be in a prevention focus. In other words, your focus, your regulatory focus, how you regulate your behavior is focused on the avoidance of undesirable outcomes and possible losses or non-losses in the environment. So you're paying attention to things that could uh, induce a loss. Yes. Yes. So the question is, can we have both? Absolutely. Most of us are dealing with both of these things. Uh, and so uh, you may be in situations where uh, because of your current state or your mood uh, or uh, the framing of a task uh, is promotion focused uh, or for reasons related to your personality or related to the environment or related to your uh, uh, to, to things that were activated in semantics because of a, per, a framing effect, uh, you may also be uh, emphasizing your promotion focus. So both of these things are going to play a role. I don't mean to suggest that you would only be in a promotion focus or a prevention focus, but there will be a balance between these things. So this is your regulatory focus. You regulate your behavior to maximize and focus on the achievement and gains, or you regulate your behavior to focus on focus on uh, avoiding a loss. Uh, and both of these things are important in behavior. Uh, so let's look at a promotion focus. Uh, you might be applying for a new job. Uh, so you're applying for a job, there's a lot of things that go through your mind when you're applying for a job, whether it's a summer job uh, or a career type job, it's something you wanna gain, right? Uh, you're interviewed by a personnel manager and you're trying to impress that person. Uh, we've all been in situations where we're interviewing and one of the things we want to get is a job. So we're paying attention to the environment, paying attention to cues. You're paying attention to a lot of things that are focused on getting that job. You strive to present yourself in the best way possible. Uh, so, you know, you, you look nice. Uh, you, you look professional, right? Uh, you talk about your achievements. Uh, you talk about what you can do. Uh, you talk about what uh, you can do to help you succeed and to help the company succeed. So you want to draw attention to the things about yourself. And you're thinking about it as, I can do this. I've done these great things. I'm a good fit for your company. Uh, we can achieve great things together. So you're trying to gain this uh, system. You're trying to present uh, yourself in a way that you can gain things. The gain is being offered the job. So you're promoting yourself. Uh, and you're focused on the things in the environment, yourself and the personnel manager in the company that are organized around this goal. So it's a promotion focus. You want to get this new job that you do not have yet. Contrast that with the same scenario with a prevention focus. You already have the job. There's a lot of competition and possibly limited funds. Uh, perhaps maybe somebody, uh, you heard rumors that people might not stay. Uh, and this does happen from time to time. Yes. What do you mean by like cognitive style when you're talking about regulatory? So a cognitive style means organizing your behaviors, organizing your thoughts uh, to emphasize one thing or the other. So in this case, a cognitive style uh, is a, a system of behaviors or a system of thoughts that lets you uh, focus on promotion or focus on prevention. Does that seem clear? Okay. Um, so here we are in a prevention focus. Again, it's employment focused. Um, if you've already got the job and you're not sure that everybody's going to keep the job forever, uh, maybe there's rumors of downsizing, 
you want to draw attention to all the things you can do, drawing attention to all of the things you can do might not help in this case. Uh, so if you want to draw attention to all of the skills that you have, that's it might not keep you at the company necessarily because it might mean that you're too good for the company or that you were planning on leaving uh, or that you're planning on trying to be promoted or uh, looking for an offer from a different company. It might work, but it might not necessarily work. Maybe what you wanna do is not screw up uh, at the job. You wanna actually just do the job as defined uh, so that you don't lose it. That focuses on avoiding the loss. So you can see in both of these scenarios, one, you don't have the job, so you wanna talk about all the things that you can do, all the creative things that you can do. You might not have the opportunity to do them, but you wanna emphasize all of your skills so that you can get the job. In this case, maybe you don't wanna emphasize all of your skills. Maybe you want to emphasize the fact that you haven't made any mistakes, uh, that you've done the job that you were hired to do really well, uh, and that you will continue to do the job that you want to do really well. These are, I'm not sure what's the best approach here, but you can see how the, the promise of getting a job and the risk of losing a job might cause you to focus on different things. This would lead to a prevention focus. You want to prevent yourself from losing that job. Um, so this idea of regulatory fit then uh, suggests that there might be times for when your focus, prevention or promotion, fits the actual uh, scenario that you're in. Uh, so in the case of getting a job, promotion focus fits the idea of getting a job. Um, a promotion focus might not fit if there were interviews for people to keep their job. Right? If you were talking about all of the creative things that you can do that aren't related to your actual job description, your promotion focus might not be the best uh, approach there. And so what the research is that we're going to talk about in just a little bit uh, suggests is that sometimes these things align. A promotion focus and a promotion or an a, approach scenario uh, leads to a fit, a fit of style and a fit of environment. And when those things fit together, uh, you're using relatively less cognitive resources. The task feels easier to do because you're in the right zone. Uh, you've adopted the right mindset for the environment. But if you're in the wrong zone, if you've adopted the wrong mindset for the environment, you see the disconnect uh, and you may need, you may, uh, you may make incorrect decisions. Uh, you might uh, use more cognitive resources. Yes? Are there situations where it doesn't matter I think it probably, there's a lot of situations where it doesn't matter. Uh, I suspect there's a lot of cases where you could take a promotion focus, you could take a prevention focus, and you're going to likely end up being roughly the same. Uh, academic environments might uh, be cases where that happens. Uh, so some of you probably uh, imagine that you can, um, you approach your exams and your quizzes by trying to get things right, trying to remember as many things as possible, trying to master the material, trying to be able to recall as many things. Other times you might focus uh, on not getting wrong answers, right? Which would be sort of a prevention focus. They may lead to the same, the, the same grade. So there's probably a lot of cases where it doesn't matter. Um, but there are some cases, and that's what we'll talk about now, where it seems to be that when, when it does matter, it's important that they line up. Uh, so if there is a scenario that is heavily oriented towards gains, a promotion focus will be helpful in those situations. There's a lot of situations where the gains aren't that strong. Maybe it doesn't really matter, uh, that kind of thing. So um, a promotion focus with a gain focus is a regulatory fit. A prevention focus with a task that is focused or oriented on loss or avoiding loss is also a fit. Regulatory fit increases the value and the feeling of fluency of one's actions. So you feel like you're doing the right thing. Uh, you feel like you have adopted the right mindset for the scenario that you're in. Um, here's just one quick example, and then we will move on to what should have been uh, the second half of class, which I promise is a little bit shorter. Um, I chose this one. There's a lot of research in this area, by the way, but I chose this one because we're going to talk about this task later on uh, when we talk about cognitive flexibility and we talk about creativity. Uh, so this remote associates task. Uh, the remote associates task is one in which your job is to come up with uh, one word that ties the others together. So if you're given the word coin, quick, and spoon, the correct answer here is silver. 
Uh, it isn't necessarily um, uh, connected to all three in the same way. So coins can be made out of silver. Quick silver uh, is a material, and you can be born with a silver spoon in your mouth, or spoons can be made out of silver. So it's a different descriptor for each one of those, but it's the one word that ties the three together. It's one word that they all have in common. So remote associates tasks so one in which you get three words or a, a, a number of words, usually three words, and you come up with something that ties them together, but it's not, the, it doesn't always have the same meaning. So it requires a little bit of creativity um, and it requires uh, cognitive flexibility because you have to realize that silver doesn't always come um, first, it isn't silver coin, silver quick, silver spoon. Uh, it doesn't have exactly the same uh, meaning in each case. Uh, so it requires you to think uh, broadly. A broad focus works in this case. Um, also, research has suggested that tasks like this, which have some degree of insight to them, have a gain function. Uh, in other words, when you get the right answer, you have gained something, you got the right answer. How many of you do uh, or have engaged uh, in that popular, if you're on Twitter, have you been playing the Wordle game? So it's, it's available in other formats, but it seems to have taken off on Twitter. It's kind of fun to get the right answer. And one of the reasons that people think that Wordle, if you haven't played it, uh, it's a game where you have to guess the right word, right five letter word in six guesses. Uh, so it's easy, it's actually kind of easy. Uh, you know, you've got um, 30 different spaces. There's only 26 letters in the English alphabet. So mostly you're going to get it. Uh, you don't always, though. So it's kind of rewarding uh, to get the right answer. You're like, I got it. Yay. It's a slightly gain focused task. Uh, it makes you feel good to get the right answer. And one of the reasons it seems to have been popular, or seems to have become popular is that you get the right answer most of the time, but not always. It's not so easy that it's always gonna be the right answer, but it's not so hard that you can't, that you would almost never get it. Most of the time, you're gonna be around 90%, you know, 80% or something. You're gonna get most of the answers most of the time. So it's got some reward structure built in. It doesn't give you any money, it doesn't give you any points. You just feel good when you get the right answer. Remote associate task seems to work in the same way. A lot of these tasks work in the same way. You don't need money, you don't need points. You just feel good when you get the right answer. That's a gain function, you wanna get that gain. Um, and so one possibility, uh, what Markman and colleagues uh, reasoned is that if we give people a whole big list of these remote associate tasks, um, that's a gain function. And if we induce a promotion focus, in other words, if we have them do something else that makes them think about promotion, there will be in a state of regulatory fit. And if they're in a state of regulatory fit, we predict that they will display greater cognitive flexibility uh, and they will be better able to perform in this task. In other words, they'll come up with more right answers for the really difficult questions because some of these are really easy. Some are really difficult and require you to really think through lots of complex uh, meanings of these words to come up with the right answer. In other words, you should see more correctly solved difficult items uh, for regulatory fit. But if you put in a regulatory mismatch, in other words, if you're induced with a prevention focus, one that focuses on avoiding loss, you'll have less cognitive fluency and you won't be able to get as many of the difficult items correct. Prevention. Like how do you change like... In this... so on exactly this slide. So, this, so <laughs> if you were asking, we were asking, how do you uh, induce the regulatory focus? Uh, yes, on this slide right here is how we induce the regulatory focus. So they gave them uh, a, an unrelated task. This happened to be uh, a perceptual task. Uh, and in each perceptual task, uh, the perceptual task I think had to do with just naming or uh, recognizing words. Um, they performed well on an unrelated perceptual task. They would be entered into a drawing for $50. So in other words, you just have to get as many points as you can. Uh, and if you get them, if you get enough points, you're going to get a drawing to get a $50 gift card. Uh, it was a simple task. Most people could get into it. Uh, so everybody ends up getting uh, a drawing, but you still had to get enough points. Uh, so this is literally a point tracker. Uh, you get to a certain level, you get entered into the drawing and you're just making perceptual decisions. Um, for the prevention subjects, 
they said, you have a drawing to reach $50. You need to now be, uh, engage in this perceptual task. Uh, and if you get a wrong answer, you lose points. And if you drop below a certain level, you lose your drawing uh, entry into the drawing. So it balanced out. It balanced out in terms of the number of correct, incorrect responses, uh, the likelihood of getting uh, the drawing into the entry into the drawing for the $50 gift card. Um, but one of them was focused on getting points to get there. The other one was focused on don't make too many mistakes or you'll lose that $50 gift card drawing. So analogous to the, I wanna get a job versus I'm gonna keep my job and not get fired. Then what they found when they looked at the hard items was that most of the people in the prevention focus condition uh, had a lot of difficulty uh, solving the difficult items. In other words, the ones that required more cognitive flexibility uh, rather than just explicit semantic retrieval of, of familiar terms like the easy items do, uh, very few people in the prevention focus were able to come up with the correct answer in this case. Uh, so there was a significant advantage for promotion focus on the difficult items, which seem to suggest greater cognitive flexibility. We'll come back to this remote associate task and cognitive flexibility at the end of the class. Uh, but the idea is anything that can uh, increase cognitive flexibility, uh, that can increase fluency in a task, can be measured with tasks like this that require uh, the benefit from flexibility, the benefit from the ability to think about things uh, from different areas. One possibility is that if you find yourself in the right fit, promotion focus, bit of a gains task, uh, things seem to be going well, you can relax a little bit because you're in the right space. And if you can relax a little bit because you're in the right space, you can think more broadly about some of these things. You can think uh, more flexibly and more creatively and so you answer more of these difficult items. Uh, it seems to be associated with that kind of thinking. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, slideshow. So I still think we're doing okay in terms of time, but I'm just gonna uh, quit this time show. I'm gonna go into my lectures, open up the mood effects, and we're just gonna continue right on as if nothing happened. Is everybody okay with that? Let's, here we go. And we're now gonna talk about context and mood. Um, and I want to talk about mood effects on cognition. So just like regulatory fit and focus uh, seem to affect our ability to make decisions, our ability to uh, appraise the world and judge the world, so does our mood. And one of the parallels is that when you're in a good mood, uh, it's analogous or similar to uh, being in that state of regulatory fit. Uh, where you're able to think more creatively, you're able to think more uh, with more uh, cognitive flexibility. So that's the, the main story here. A little bit more cognitive flexibility uh, in a good mood. Uh, negative mood, uh, like uh, sadness and anger, uh, which have a different state of arousal, um, they seem to narrow some attentional focus. Uh, so mood effects on cognition. Uh, sadness seems to narrow attentional focus, uh, reducing motivation. Uh, angry mood may also narrow attentional focus uh, by focusing on the thing that might be uh, putting you in a negative mood or putting you in an angry mood. Uh, whereas positive mood seems to have this general effect of increasing cognitive flexibility. Uh, all things being equal, when you're in a good mood, you're more likely to explore alternatives. When you're in a sad mood, uh, you might have reduced motivation, so less likely to explore. When you're in an angry mood, you might wanna focus on the thing that's making you angry. So it's this positive mood that I wanna spend a little bit more time uh, talking about. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't mean to say that they're necessarily the same. I mean that the outcome behavior uh, might be a similar kind of outcome behavior. So regulatory fit, uh, when you find yourself in uh, prevention and uh, loss versus promotion and gain, so the, the, there's a fit between your focus and the task, uh, seems to encourage greater cognitive flexibility uh, because your approach and your regulatory focus matches the environment, you're in the right space. Uh, we see the same kinds of effects uh, for positive mood. 
possibly for different reasons. So they're not exactly the same, but the behaviors that we're gonna see, the behaviors that we're gonna measure uh, do seem to be similar. So it's this uh, increased cognitive flexibility, the likelihood to be able to look uh, for more alternatives, to explore more alternatives, that seems to be the similarity. Does that help? Okay, good. So let's look at a couple of quick examples. I wanna talk briefly about negative mood, and then I wanna talk more about positive mood. Um, one of the earlier studies uh, that's looked at these kinds of effects here uh, is puts people in a happy or a negative mood by asking them to write a story about a correspondingly happy or sad event. Um, so if you're asked to think about something that happened to you that put you in a good mood and you write a story about it, now you're thinking about something that made you happy. If you were asked to think about something that put you in a sad mood, a disappointing event, time when you disappointed someone, uh, and then you write a story about it, you're probably gonna be in a sad mood because you've had to remember something that sometime when you disappointed someone. Uh, nobody likes to disappoint somebody, put you in a bad mood. Um, what they found was that negative mood subjects were more likely to choose matches based on the local feature. In other words, a narrower attentional focus. This is a forced choice task. And in this forced choice task, there are there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. Your job is to pick which one of these two is the best match to the target. And in this study, you can see that if you choose based on configuration, which they call the global match, which is a broader attentional focus, you don't really care about the constituent shapes. You just care about the orientation of the shapes. Uh, so in other words, you take a big picture of you, you can, uh, match these based on their configuration. Uh, it doesn't matter that one's triangles in a triangle shape and the other one's squares in a triangle shape. What matters is they have the same number, they have the same shape and they have the same orientation. It's a global approach. This is a featural or a local approach because this has a different number and a different configuration, but it's made out of the same kinds of triangles. No right answer, no wrong answer, but what they found was that sad subjects were more likely to make this kind of match on a variety of trials, suggesting a narrower attentional focus, an attention to details, as opposed to an attention uh, to configurations or broader contextual shapes. Um, in some of my own research, this is a paper that's uh, it's a number of years old now, but uh, two of my graduate students uh, did this study a few years ago. Um, and we were interested more in the positive mood, though we used both positive and negative mood. Uh, but we also used category learning and classification learning, because that's my main interest. Uh, I use category learning as a proxy for complex cognition. Uh, we talked about category learning a few uh, weeks ago, but in a category learning task, you're learning to take an object, assign it to different uh, different groups, right? You're learning to form a behavioral equivalence class. And that involves attention to features, attention to detail, also attention to the big picture, attention to family resemblance. Uh, sometimes it involves looking for a single verbalizable rule. Sometimes it also involves cognitive flexibility and uh, some kind of inhibitory control where you might need to pay attention to one rule that doesn't work, you inhibit that, and then you need to find another rule. So there's a lot of different kinds of behaviors that go on when people are learning to create these behavioral equivalence classes, which in my opinion, makes it a great proxy for complex cognition in general. More than just making a choice, you're learning how to form a behavioral equivalence class. And I'll show you how we uh, manipulated this. Um, so first of all, we asked our subjects uh, to give us some prior ratings on videos and music. Uh, we picked a series of songs which we thought, or music clips, which we thought were happy, some which we thought were neutral, and some that we thought were uh, sad, so negative uh, mood. And we had people rate them. Uh, so you can see some classical music pieces here, Mozart, Handel, and Vivaldi, all positive, upbeat uh, pieces. Uh, some instrumental stuff here, uh, none of which I'm familiar with, but all sounded pretty neutral. People didn't really think it was positive or negative. It was just kind of chill music, right? It didn't really put you in a good mood. didn't put you in a bad mood. It was just music. Uh, and then some negative music, theme songs and things like Schindler's List, uh, which have a very negative minor tone and happen to also have a connotation with the movie uh, with a lot of uh, sadness involved in it. 
Um, then we collected some videos on YouTube, which given the 12 years ago, uh, you may remember these in your distant memory uh, from like grade seven or something or whatever. There were videos of things like a baby laughing hysterically. This is before TikTok. This is before Vine. Uh, this is before all of those things. So we had to use short YouTube videos. Um, so things that people thought were really funny, things like the Antiques Roadshow television show, which people thought were interesting, but like really super neutral. Uh, so if somebody's just talking about, you know, like here's a, a painting that my grandmother discovered. And if you ever watch Antiques Roadshow, it can be emotional inducing if somebody finds out their thing is worth, you know, $10,000, uh, then that's going to put them in a good mood. We didn't show that part. We just showed the description, <laughs> just showed a description of the antique itself. So very neutral, not positive, not negative. Whereas, uh, you know, stories about a child with cancer, uh, or in this case, it was a massive earthquake in China that had just happened, uh, that was in the news at the time, and people found this to be a very uh, distressing story to watch. So they had a video that was positive. So they did both. First, we primed them by having them listen to happy, medium, or sad music. And then after they were in that mood, we asked them to watch a happy, neutral or sad video. So there was never a mismatch. You're always happy, happy, medium, medium, or sorry, neutral, neutral, or sad, sad. So we tried to put people in a really positive mood, a negative mood, or a neutral mood. Then we asked them to classify some exemplars into one of two categories. Uh, the exemplar in this case was a crystal ball that belonged to either uh, the blue wizard or the green wizard. Uh, and these were based on uh, a series of combinations of features, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, but basically you see a crystal ball with a pattern on it and you make a choice. Is this a blue wizard or is this a green wizard crystal ball? Uh, and then you get feedback that tells you if you were correct or incorrect. Um, what's important about this task though, uh, is there were one of two kinds of structures that you had to learn. You either learned a rule described structure for which you had to figure out the verbalizable decision boundary. Verbalizable decision boundary in this case means um, that there's something about the frequency of the light and dark bands, that if you can find that and you can pay attention to it, it's a local feature, it's not a global feature, it's one single feature, you can describe it and it'll get most of the answers correct. But you can see that it's also not easy to see. I mean, what's the difference between the spatial frequency here and the spatial frequency here? And by spatial frequency, I mean the number of alternating light and dark bands. So these are slightly high, they're slightly smaller than these. You can see how there's a little bit more here. This is a really good example of low spatial frequency. This is a good example of high spatial frequency, but here we made it really difficult to find. We made it difficult, we made it not difficult to find or to notice the orientation you can see that they tilt forwards and backwards, but that is not very useful in learning how to classify these because it's irrelevant. So what subjects have to do when they wanna learn this is they have to find the rule that's correct. And in their case, it's, it's the frequency of the light and dark bands, but they've gotta first ignore the rule that they are likely to try first, which is the orientation. So you notice a lot of change each time you see a crystal ball it's gonna point one direction or the other. That's the first thing you're gonna notice. And you're gonna try that as a rule and it's gonna turn out to be irrelevant. But it takes a while to figure that out. Uh, so you slowly figure out, oh, there's another strategy. Maybe it's the frequency. Uh, some of them seem like they're a little bit, there's more lines than others. Uh, if you can do that, if you've got some degree of cognitive flexibility, you should be able to uh, of ignore or inhibit the attention you placed on the orientation and pay attention to the spatial frequency. In other words, this task should benefit from anything uh, that involves cognitive flexibility, like regulatory fit and also like uh, positive mood. For this category structure here though, some subjects learn this one. And in this case, you can see there's a lot of variability across both dimensions, the orientation and the frequency dimension but there's no one single rule that lets you define them. Uh, and furthermore, it's kind of a, a non-verbalizable rule. It tends to be that these things tilt a little bit more to the right. And if they tilt more to the right, they tend to be a little bit higher frequency, but it isn't necessarily a rule that you can verbalize. You can't just say high frequency this side, 
low frequency that side. You'll see that they are high and low frequency for both categories. So you've got to integrate the dimensions into a single perceptual whole. Um, and a lot of the research we've done on this kind of task suggests that that's what people do. Uh, rather than trying to learn a verbalizable rule, they learn a region and decision space, and they learn to integrate those dimensions into a single perceptual object and then make the decision. So there's a boundary, but subjects can't describe the boundary uh, uh, with language. This kind of task would not necessarily benefit from increased cognitive flexibility. Uh, so if you're in a positive mood, you won't necessarily do any better in this case, because flexibility doesn't give you much of an advantage here. You've got to pay attention to both, and you need to adopt a global perspective or a holistic perspective uh, to do better in a task like this. Uh, and that's exactly what we found in our results. So what we found is that when people were in a positive mood and they were learning the rule described categories, they started off better and they stayed uh, better. So they learned these categories more quickly. And this suggests um, our suggestion or our hypothesis that it had to do with cognitive flexibility. Um, when they were in a negative mood, they started off uh, a little bit lower. Now, I got to say, this is not a significant uh, advantage here. Um, these, uh, the negative mood and the neutral mood tended to be equal. We were predicting a disadvantage for negative mood early on, but in the paper, we explain that we think that once people get through a few blocks of trials, they kind of lose whatever negative mood they're in because they start getting correct answers. You can see here, even if you're in a negative mood, uh, you do improve a little bit and you improve a little bit more. And so now you've probably forgotten the sad music and the earthquake video, uh, and you're focused on actually getting correct answers. So probably that puts you in a slightly, slightly better mood. You don't maintain the negative mood. Uh, and you're able to achieve uh, decent performance, but nowhere near the kind of advantage that people show with the positive mood. We also noticed that for the uh, non-rule described categories, what we called the information integration category set, for which the two features need to be integrated into a single perceptual unit, uh, where we didn't predict any advantage for cognitive flexibility, and we did not predict an advantage uh, for positive mood, we did not find an advantage for positive mood. So there didn't seem to be a mood effect at all. Uh, in this case, positive, neutral, or negative, you just need to learn to associate the stimulus with the response uh, and to learn that overall family resemblance structure. Um, the last topic I wanna talk about uh, has to do with cognitive control and the environment. Uh, so what we've seen with things like regulatory fit is that sometimes when you're in the right mindset, uh, that matches with the task, matches with the environment, you perform well. Uh, when there's a mismatch, you don't. What we see with positive and negative mood is that when you're in a positive mood and you're in a task or an environment that maximizes or benefits from some degree of flexibility or exploration, you can also perform a little bit better. When you're in a task that uh, requires some degree of cognitive control, so regulation of behavior, that kind of uh, delay of gratification that Michelle was interested in, or the examples I started with at the beginning of class, like having to drive in a stressful situation. If you're in that kind of a situation, that's going to require cognitive control and it's going to require effort. Uh, there's some suggestion in the literature that that is also a limited resource, which makes sense. I mean, most of your behavior, most of our behaviors are limited. We can only do so much for so long. You can only stay in class. Uh, for so long, which is why we take a break, usually at about an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, it's difficult to maintain your focus. It requires effort. Uh, so we need to take a break every so often. There was a theory that was popular up until about five years ago, and then I'll discuss sort of how this theory fell apart. Um, one of the reasons it was so popular is that it fits in pretty well with some of these other things we've talked about. Uh, it fits in well with the idea uh, that we intuitively feel ourselves being taxed when we have to continually avoid something. Uh, with the last two years of dealing with uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and all of the different changes we've had, most of us have, many people have reported feeling just generally fatigued. I mean, I'm sure you're the same as me, like you're just kind of tired of it. 
Uh, yes, you recognize there are risks. Uh, yes, we recognize that COVID has not gone away, but we're also just tired of thinking about it and tired of dealing about it or dealing with it. One of the th things that somebody asked me last year when they said, um, what's the first thing you wanna do when you get your second, because remember last year we thought the two vaccines would be enough uh, <laughs> before we realized that it wasn't. Uh, they're like, oh yeah, once you get your second vaccine, you'll be fully vaccinated. And I think in our minds, we all kind of treated it as if it was gonna be a force field, right? You're gonna get those two vaccines and then you are immune. Like you can do whatever you want, you're invincible. Uh, nobody really believed that, but I think we kind of wanted to believe it. And so people would say, what are you gonna do? What's the first thing you're gonna do when you're fully vaccinated? Um, I just thought like, I don't wanna think about COVID for a few months. I would just like to have two or three months where I can think about something else and there'll be something else in the news, uh, something else to think about or to, or to work on that is not COVID related. That never happened, uh, turns out. But um, intuitively, we feel like if we're always thinking about something, if we're always concentrating on something, worrying about something, it's gonna affect our performance further on down the line. That does seem to be the case. This was explored systematically uh, in the early 2000s by Roy Baumeister and some others. Now, if you follow the li literature in social psychology, uh, Roy Baumeister uh, is one of the psychologists who's at the center of what then became known as the uh, reproducibility or replication crisis in social psychology. Uh, the crisis seems to be that a lot of these effects don't hold up, they don't replicate very well. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the ideas are entirely wrong. It just means that the uh, tasks and the paradigms and the experiments that elucidated or elicited these effects aren't very well controlled all the time. So there is some debate about whether or not ego depletion, which is Baumeister's term, uh, is a, a scientifically stable effect. Intuitively, it seems like it is. And that's one of the biggest challenges is that if something seems intuitively correct, uh, we're more likely to believe it, right? I mean, we have a confirmation bias. Uh, we have a tendency to think, oh yeah, I, when I'm tired, I make bad decisions. I mean, we kind of know that's true, uh, but the degree to which this particular theory of self-control works is a different question. But let's talk about it because I think it's still a useful framework. And there is some evidence that this is a stable effect but maybe not as stable as Baumeister thought. So uh, Baumeister suggests that the active self is a limited resource. So the strong version of this theory is that if you have to suppress your emotion, if you have to be emotionless, or if you have to focus your attention for an extended period of time, and then you have to do something else that also is cognitively demanding, your performance is gonna suffer because it's a finite resource. It's like a muscle. You can only exercise for so long. You don't lift weights for so long. You can only go out for a run for so long. You go out for a 10K, uh, and then you try to go for another 10K later in the day, your second 10K is not going to be as good, right? Because you, you're tired out. Uh, and the idea is that self-control works in the same way, and it can be replenished. Um, some of this doesn't work, but some of it still does. So his original experiments in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, asked people to perform acts of self-regulation similar to what Michelle was asking uh, children to engage in. Um, performing an act of self-regulation affects performance on a subsequent executive function task, executive function in this case, meaning any task that requires cognitive control. Um, suggesting the two types of tasks, even if they're different on the surface, share a limited uh, resource. So his one of his first examples uh, was uh, participants were given, they were in a lab doing a task, uh, and they had to eat radishes instead of the chocolate that was there. Or they might come in and uh, the Baumeister lab would have uh, just had some freshly baked uh, chocolate chip cookies available, but you couldn't have any. Uh, all you got to snack on were radishes. Uh, so kinds of things that would involve some degree uh, of cognitive control. Um, I mean, we see this kind of thing all the time, right? I mean, it's hard to concentrate in the spring, for example, when the weather starts to change. The weather's nice outside. Who wants to be in a classroom, right? Uh, it's probably for a good thing that we have our final exams uh, in mid-April because the weather hasn't gotten uh, any nicer. Um, but 
the degree to which we have to try to regulate our behavior is limited. Um, so when participants forced themselves to eat radishes instead of the chocolates, they displayed reduced persistence on puzzle solving tasks. So in other words, you can't have the chocolate, but it's right there in front of you. It looks delicious. There's chocolate chip cookies. How about you have a radish instead? Um, which, you know, I, I guess radishes are okay, but I mean, maybe not as good as cookies. Um, and in this case, uh, they were less likely uh, to persist in a puzzle solving task that was difficult to do. Um, ego depleted, in, in, so ego depletion in this case means a depletion of self control. Uh, so this idea of an ego depletion is anytime your self control resources are depleted. Uh, from doing something that requires self-control, you have less ability to do something that requires self-control in the future. Um, Ego-depleted individuals tend to depend more heavily on heuristics and commit decision-making errors. That seems reasonable given what we've discuss discussed already with system one and system two. If you have fewer cognitive resources, all things being equal, you're more likely to uh, default to system one, rely on a heuristic. Uh, if you have to regulate your emotion, so, so um, Schmeichel had a series of tasks where subjects would uh, need to watch something, uh, whether it was positive or negative, but display no emotion. So if you're watching something that is uh, really funny, but you're not laughing at it, that requires some kind of control. If you're watching something that's you know, potentially traumatizing or horrifying or uh, frightening, but display no emotion, uh, that also requires cognitive control. If you're watching something that's really cringe inducing uh, and you try not to look like you're you know, emphasizing with the cringe, that requires some kind of cognitive control. Um, they perform more poorly on subsequent tasks of working memory and inhibitory control. Um, this one, by the way, this uh, measurable glucose, uh, this is one of the tasks that turns out to not replicate very strongly. But let me just mention it now. Um, there was a, the strongest form of this theory suggested that exerting self-control uses a measurable amount of blood glu glucose. I mean, any cognitive behavior is going to require uh, blood glucose because whatever you're doing uh, requires uh, oxygen uh, in the brain. And that's gonna also carry with it uh, anything else that's required for neurons to uh, uh, to be metabolizing uh, and functioning. Um, the suggestion was that after doing a difficult task, you can replenish this uh, with some kind of uh, energy drink, a sugary drink, uh, something that has sugar in it. Um, that doesn't necessarily seem to work, uh, but that was sort of one of the strongest potential uh, uh, tests of this theory uh, was that you could counteract ego depletion uh, by taking a drink of something that has uh, glucose in it. You've probably heard uh, the claim that, have you heard, heard anybody say like, oh, you can, you know, if you're taking a test, you gotta have like candy or something to sort of help you uh, focus a little bit more. It doesn't really work that way, but uh, that was a belief for a while inspired by some of this research that having something with a quick glucose release uh, can help you concentrate. Probably it just helps you want more sugar. Is that why like teachers in high school used to give us mints during like big standardized tests? Yes, I suspect that's why. I suspect the real reason is just to sort of put people in a positive mood. Uh, so there's a bit of a confound there. Uh, if you're offered a small piece of hard candy, uh, it also just makes you feel better because somebody gave you something nice, somebody's caring for you. Uh, and that might also allow you to sustain some of your behavior a little bit longer. Um, so I don't know if either one of those is a better explanation, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. So that idea that, yes, have some uh, hard candy or have mints or a little bit of snacks while you're taking your exam. Not too much, not like a you know, big pile of chips or something, uh, but just a little sugar you know, uh, to keep you going. Um, we use this task, uh, same, this is the same student, uh, Rachel, who uh, did the um, uh, experiment with me on the uh, mode uh, induction. Uh, we also use the same paradigm to investigate cognitive depletion. Uh, our task actually worked fairly well. Um, same idea, we ask people to, use, to learn either rule-described or non-rule-described categories, exactly the same type of category structure as on that um, 
uh, as on the, the uh, mode induction task. Um, in this case, uh, first we ask them to, uh, to do an ego depletion task uh, and, or a control task, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then we ask them to do a rule defined or a non rule defined category uh, learning experiment. Uh, so same experiment that I just told you about. If it required learning a rule, in this case, it benefited from some degree of cognitive flexibility, but it also benefited from some degree of executive control. Because remember in that task, uh, you had to overcome the simple perceptual uh, orientation uh, rule which didn't work, uh, inhibit the attention to orientation and focus your attention on something that's a little bit more difficult to find uh, in order to uh, find the correct rule. That kind of uh, cognitive control did not seem to be at play in the other category structure, the non-rule described category structure. So in our ego depletion condition, uh, we used something that had been used in some other uh, papers that we found. Uh, which was uh, asking subjects to write a story without using the letters A or N, uh, which are very common letters, as you can see. Um, we can find A's and N's uh, throughout here. So uh, there's an N, there's an N, uh, there's an N. Uh, they're common letters, there's an A. Trying to write a story without using the letter A, without using the letter N, is gonna be difficult. Uh, you can do it. But in order to do it, um, if we're really you know, monitoring people's behavior, uh, they're gonna make a lot of mistakes. They're gonna write words that have the letter A and N in them, and then they scratch those out. Uh, and then they have to come up with other words. So it, it's cognitively demanding. You get 10 minutes and we're asking them to, do, to write as long of a story or an interesting story without using those two letters. Uh, and the instructions require them to, uh, to replace words if they if they see the you know if they, if they use the letter n they've got to find a different word so there's a lot of concentration you're trying to come up with a story you're trying to write the words but you're also monitoring them as you're writing them down you're then checking them uh, and the suggestion is that this requires a little bit of extra resources and concentration it's not impossible but certainly to do it well it requires you to concentrate on what you're writing in a different way than just writing a story with no restrictions you just write some pointless story for 10 minutes about something that happened to you, and you're not really thinking about much. So both people, 10 minutes doing something, both people, 10 minutes writing, both people, 10 minutes writing a pointless story, but in one case, they have to continually monitor whether or not they're using A or N. In some ways, uh, it might have been, there's other ways in which we could have done it. We might have asked people to count the number of times they accidentally uh, write a letter A or N or something like that, which would be even more complex. So monitoring and counting and then reporting back. Uh, but this seems to require more effort. Other research in the field suggested that it can induce a state of ego depletion. Uh, so it can tire people out just a little bit. Then we asked them to learn these category sets where there was either a boundary that they had to find or no linear or no verbalizable boundary, but a linear rule that required attention uh, and integration of both dimensions. And what we found was a similar effect, but the reverse of what we showed in the mode induction task. In this case, uh, we showed um, that participants who were in the ego depletion uh, condition, which is the triangle here, uh, performed less well, it took them longer uh, to acquire the category structure uh, participants in the control condition uh, found the rule more quickly. And there was no effect for the non-rule described categories. So participants learned those categories at the same slow rate, whether or not they were in ego depletion condition or not, because in this case, the extra cognitive flexibility for not being depleted uh, doesn't help your performance or doesn't seem to help your performance. So in the previous task, being in a good mood helped you do well, in this case, being ego depleted uh, seemed to reduce your performance uh, significantly. Last topic I wanna to talk about, um, oh, sorry, I thought I was on the last topic. Um, this was just a summary. Uh, so positive mood induction improved uh, and that even 10 minutes of mood, uh, positive mood can start to eliminate some of those ego depletion effects. So there might be a relationship uh, between the two. Now is that the final one? So the end of the ego depletion theory. So a few years ago, this started in 2016. How many of you are familiar with the idea 
of the replication crisis or the reproducibility crisis in psychology. So if you've uh, taken psychology courses in the last two or three years, this has probably come up. Um, it's not exclusive to psychology. Science in general, uh, lots of times where things don't work uh, in lots of different sciences. There are you know, pharmaceutical treatments which were believed to, be, uh, to work well, which turn out to not be as strong of a treatment. Uh, there's neuroimaging research uh, for which uh, techniques that may have been used 15 years ago might not produce the same kind of reliable results. Um, this reproducibility crisis seems to center on um, social psychology. Uh, and it centers on the idea that there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, most journals in psychology like to publish things with significant results. Uh, you don't like to publish things with non-significant results because then there's no story there unless the researcher went out of their way to try to find something in as many ways as possible and couldn't find it. Then it's an interesting story. But if you just have a single experiment or two experiments and you say, we manipulated this and nothing happened, that's just not very interesting. Uh, it might be that you're, the effect that you were looking for doesn't exist. It might be that you've manipulated it in the wrong way. It might mean that you made a mistake. Um, and so there's a general bias to publish things that show significant results. Um, and at the same time, many of these experiments, ego depletion, only one of them, there were lots of others. Uh, behavioral priming is another example. Um, also seem to be paradigms which were difficult to reproduce in other labs. Uh, so I talked briefly about uh, Baumeister's experiments where they might have cookies in the lab and radishes. Well, if you want to reproduce that exactly, you'd have to have exactly what cookies, right? Uh, and exactly what did those cookies smell like? How old were those cookies? Uh, were they freshly baked or were they freshly purchased from the bakery? Um, how long were they sitting there? How many were in the room? You can record some of that, um, but maybe not all of it. What was the exact size and configuration of the laboratory such that smells from the cookies could reach the participants right here? Um, there are a lot of things that might be difficult to reproduce. Uh, if you're running an experiment like this and you're trying to elicit effect, you try lots of things. And maybe you try five or six different ways, and then one of them seems to produce this striking effect. Uh, the other four or five don't produce that striking effect. What's the conclusion? The conclusion could be that you were lucky, uh, that one of those just happened to work by chance. An alternative conclusion could be uh, that it's a stable effect and you just couldn't quite figure out how to manipulate the scenarios to draw that effect out. And so some of those pilot results uh, didn't do it in the right way. It's hard to tell sometimes in psychology what those positive results are, the significant results are in relationship to the maybe lots of non-significant results because those trials often don't get reported. Uh, so if you've tried 13 different experiments to try to elicit an effect and you publish the one that worked, you don't know what all those other ones, you don't see the evidence of all those others. So it might just be by chance, but it might also be by design, that it's a strong effect and it took a while to figure out how to measure it. Uh, both are possible. And so as psychology progresses, sometimes it turns out that it looks more like the former, like chance. Uh, than like the latter, or some combination uh, that in some cases, maybe the scenario or the setup of the lab depended on something very specific to the way in which the researcher and the research assistants approached their subjects uh, that caused the behavior, not the manipulation itself. So ego depletion uh, has been reported in the literature, studies supporting this idea of ego depletion, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers. It's actually a fairly rich uh, literature. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that ego depletion seemed to work the way researchers expected it to. Uh, whole labs and careers were devoted to this idea. Um, however, uh, at some point, it seemed like there was evidence for a lot of bias. Uh, and furthermore, that when you looked at the papers that found these effects, they tended to cluster around certain uh, research labs in certain areas. So there was a suspicion that maybe some people could, could, could measure ego depletion and other labs couldn't reproduce them in the same way. Uh, that's a problem. So what happened was uh, in 20, 2016, 
um, there was a pre-registered replication attempt uh, where 23 labs across the world tried with a single paradigm to see if they could find the ego depletion effect. In other words, all of these different labs, including 2,000 subjects, 23 different labs across the world followed the same instructions. The thought was that if it's a stable effect, we should be able to measure it across all of these different labs simultaneously, and that on balance, more should find it than not. What they found was not, actually. For this particular task, um, and one of the criticisms, of course, is that they chose one particular task. Uh, there was a slight variation of the task that they were originally trying to measure. Uh, so they chose a task where you had to press a button uh, if you saw a specific letter. Um, and in this case, uh, it, it is an ego depleting task. And then you were asked uh, to do a second, uh, a, a second task, um, uh, which requires some degree of uh, attentional control, in this case, solving puzzles. Uh, this line here, this zero line for this meta-analysis is the no effect line. Anytime the mean and range or the, uh, uh, the confidence interval uh, for each one of these labs overlaps this no effect line, it suggests that they found whatever they found was not a significant effect. So they measured something but it wasn't able to be differentiated from a null result. And with this seems to suggest that the data are kind of all over the place. Uh, some labs uh, are finding what looks like uh, no effect of ego depletion at all. In fact, an inhibitory effect of ego depletion where the ego depleted participants actually perform better. Other labs are finding cases where it looks like uh, the ego depleted condition um, performed worse. So in other words, a stronger effect of ego depletion. But what you can see is the one thing that's constant is that just about all the labs find data that overlap this zero point. Uh, so the worry was that, okay, if this one task, and we recognize that there are lots of hundreds of studies that looked at ego depletion, lots of different ways to elicit ego depletion, but if this one task kind of looks like this, well, what does the rest of the field look like? And this, along with two or three other studies, kicked off what's known as this replication uh, crisis. It's not really a crisis, I guess, but maybe it was a crisis if you worked for 10 years <laughs> on ego depletion and realized that uh, your research wasn't as stable as you thought. Uh, maybe it's not a crisis for psychology and social psychology in general because it got people thinking about ways to control their experiments uh, more strongly, control their experiments in better ways. So it might've been a personal crisis for some, but in general, it's a good thing for psychology because it causes you to look more critically at the evidence. And in this case, looking critically at the evidence uh, suggests that there's a very shallow effect. A lot of these effects do hold up. A lot of uh, ego depletion effects have been replicated uh, and been extended uh, in different scenarios, but uh, the literature doesn't seem to be as uh, straightforward as was once uh, suspected. Uh, local interference. I want to talk about two more tasks here, and I think I promised we would try to finish up at 12 o'clock, but it looks like it's uh, increasingly not going to happen. Um, but I want to talk about these very briefly. Does everybody have 10 more minutes of effort? I don't want to cognitively, I don't want to deplete your egos. Uh, but I think I can finish up because these are fairly quick. Um, so at the very beginning, I showed this slide in the first uh, class, and I suggested that people are um, we use our devices, right? We have multiple devices. Most of you, how many of you have two devices on your desk right now at this very minute? You got a laptop or a, or a tablet and a phone right next to it, right? That's commonplace uh, to have more than one device. Um, as these people do, they have multiple devices. And whether or not they're distracted or using the task in a way by one of those, what's the little quiz that they use all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're probably doing something like that, uh, where they're just, the teacher has put something on there and they're uh, responding on their phone really quickly. Uh, so we, we're, we're kind of comfortable with that idea, but we also recognize there's a distraction. Um, and this became a, a fairly interesting area of research uh, in the uh, early mid 2000s, as it became clear that more and more people carried a smartphone with them or a cell phone with them all the time. Uh, now, in 2015, that's quite a while ago now, um, people's behaviors with their smartphones and cell phones were different. 
First of all, they called them cell phones, uh, not just smartphones. And lots of people had notifications turned on. Uh, so your phone would buzz all the time when something happened or make a ping. Or back in the old days, you could even, for some reason, pay money to download a ringtone, uh, if you can remember those olden times. Um, so we suspect there's an attentional cost. Um, and there is an attentional cost. If you're, if you're like me, your phone doesn't make any kind of noise. It doesn't make much, uh, sometimes occasionally it'll buzz if one thing, if it's like a notification that I want to happen. But if I get a phone call, if someone actually is calling the phone, like on the voice part of the phone, uh, it sort of throbs in an unpleasant way, right? It doesn't just ping, because usually that's an emergency, right? If somebody's calling me, it's going to be something that's actually important, as opposed to just my calendar telling me, yeah, it's time for your next appointment or something. So they wondered what happens when you get a cell phone notification. Um, so here's a task that they designed to measure vigilance. This is called the sustained attention to response task. Uh, participants were instructed to press a key when a number is flashed, except if the number was three. So anytime a number flashes, as soon as the number flashes, you have to press a key. Uh, so other symbols, you don't press anything because that's just your uh, fixation point. Uh, but as soon as this number flashes, you have to press it as quickly as possible. Uh, but you withhold any time a three is pressed. So you can see that if you're just responding based on uh, rhythm, so every uh, 500, uh, every 900 milliseconds, you press the key because a new number is going to be responding, uh, you're going to have some incorrect responses because when the three is pressed, you're not supposed to press the button. You have to withhold your response. Uh, but you're still going to make, you're probably going to make some mistakes in this task. Uh, so if you're going along, you're going along, pressing the button, there's a five, there's a seven, there's a two, there's a one, then a three, you're kind of pressing it. Now you got to stop. Every so often, you're going to make a mistake. Uh, you're going to make a commission error. In other words, you're going to press the button when you should not have. Uh, and that is a measure of sustained attention. It requires more effort than just uh, pressing the button in rhythm. Uh, it requires you to press the button and then occasionally not press it. And as you probably all know, anybody who plays video games of any kind, I'm not much of a gamer at all, but if you play video games of any kind, uh, there's lots of cases where you're doing something and then you have to not do it, right? Maybe you press the wrong button or you make the wrong response or you uh, engage in the wrong action. Uh, even though you know it was wrong, you couldn't stop yourself from initiating that response. That's exactly what happens here. So in this experiment, what they did, uh, sorry, um, what they did was they asked people to engage in this task, and then they had them get text message responses or phone calls. So when they enrolled in the experiment, uh, you gave your number to the experimenter under the auspices of being contacted again. Uh, and then you were asked to put your phone down. Uh, and then what would happen was automatically, it wasn't the researchers themselves, uh, the program they designed would automatically, on a regular basis, send text messages to your phone, uh, which would then result in a notification. Uh, this would happen uh, on a regular basis, and it, would be, it should be distracting. Um, or, in some cases, you would actually get a phone call. So you're sitting there in the lab, got your computer in front of you while you're trying to press the button carefully. You've got your phone here, and all of a sudden, it rings. Well, maybe once that's not a big deal, but if it happens again, you would be like, all right, somebody died um, or there's an emergency and you would start to get distracted. And what would happen, what they predicted was that it would be, I mean, probably you would say, uh, I got to take this. But even before that, what would probably happen uh, is that your performance would suffer here. Uh, because if it's starting to ring and send you notifications and you're trying to pay attention here, uh, you're going to be dividing your attention now. Uh, and if you're dividing your attention, you're not always going to see the three in time to withhold your response correctly. That's kind of what they found. So in block one, everybody performed without notifications. So block one is, a, is one block through the task. All three groups performed with no notifications. So they should not differ. Uh, there'll be some small difference based on just random errors. Uh, or random responses, but people who got the text message did not differ significantly from those who got no notification and those who got the call. Uh, so this is the probability of making a commission error. In other words, making that uh, incorrect response. Block one should be equal and it was equal. 
because in block one, there was no interference. Uh, everybody just said, here's one block, nothing happens. But in block two, that's when the manipulation um, happened. And you can see that in block two, the no notification group did not change uh, because for them, nothing was different. Block one, there was no notification. Block two, there was no notification. But you can see that the call group and the text message started making more errors. Uh, one or two interferences uh, or text messages or phone calls was enough to throw their game off. Uh, so they show the cost. They start making more commission errors um, because now your attention is divided. Uh, and if it can be divided on a really local level like this, it can be divided probably on a global level. If your performance suffers at a very small perceptual level by receiving notifications, uh, that adds up. Uh, you have to ignore them. Yes. So block one and two are the same group of people, just with time in between? Yes. Block one and two are the same. Uh, everybody's in the same, uh, doing the same thing. Uh, block one is one block through the sustained attention response test, take a break. Uh, at this point, there's no difference between the conditions in block one and two. Now block two, uh, these people, same subjects, now they're getting calls, performance gets worse. Now nothing happens, performance doesn't change. Now they're getting text messages, performance gets worse. Last example I wanna uh, talk about. Uh, so here we're suggesting that uh, interfering noises uh, will reduce your performance because they're gonna cause you to get distracted. One of two things can happen. One, you're either actually just getting distracted and so you're splitting your attention or uh, you are actively engaging in suppression. In other words, you're inhibiting attention so that you don't pay attention. Now you're trying to focus, that also takes cognitive resources. Sometimes though, the ambient noise might help. Uh, so some cases, if there's one thing, uh, like a text message notification, that's gonna interfere. But if there's a lot of activity going around, like working in one of the, uh, like that really nice uh, Somerville House uh, study area that they just built this past year, or one of the, like the atrium in the library or physics and astronomy atrium. It's kind of a nice vibe in there, right? There might be people working, but not anybody talking loud enough for you to pay attention to their conversation. It's just ambient noise. There's some suggestion that that could actually improve performance. So uh, this is a little bit tight, but a lot of people like working like this. Uh, so here I am, uh, on a laptop designing a this very lecture uh, a few years ago in a Starbucks. Uh, a lot of people like to work in coffee houses for a number of reasons, but one seems to be that working in a public space, and it doesn't have to be a coffee shop or a Starbucks, but working in a public space like this allows you to focus better on certain kinds of tasks because now there's not one thing drawing your attention away. There's lots of things. Uh, and none of them competes for your attention, uh, which allows you to easily just uh, drown out those distractions and focus on the thing that you're trying to do. Uh, it's different than being alone with your own thoughts in a quiet room, though some people prefer that kind of environment also. Uh, so some of us like this because it allows us to focus on what we're doing without paying attention uh, to noises. Uh, some of us kind of like the quieter uh, floor environment where there are fewer individual distractions, but you'll notice there's still some kind of ambient vibe going on there. There's other people making noise. Maybe they're not talking, uh, but they're moving around and walking and so on. Um, isn't that sort of also for the social facilitation though? Like if you're by yourself, you're probably gonna be a little bit easier, but if you're kind of around people, you don't- yes, social facilitation, absolutely. So if you're in an environment like this, well, you're thinking books, right? You're thinking, I got to study because I'm at the study table. I'm on the quiet floor. Uh, if you're here and you're, everybody's on their laptop, they're not, they're, this, is not the, this is not the Starbucks where you go to have uh, conversations with other parents with young children who are drinking hot chocolate and everything else. This is clearly the coffee place where you go to work with other university students because that's what they're doing. So there's some social facilitation. You find the place that seems to work. Um, but one possibility is that the overall ambience there uh, allows you to concentrate a little bit better. It's gonna be correlated with that social facilitation and the expectations, absolutely. A couple of experiments looked at this directly um, in a study from a few years ago by Ravi Mehta, this I think at UBC, um, they used uh, this remote associate task that I was talking about before. 
um, where they asked people to uh, solve uh, easy, medium, and difficult remote associate tasks uh, in a variety of different sound environments. So they held the uh, actual environment constant by having people do it in a lab, and they played for them sounds like uh, that they had recorded. Um, in this case, uh, sounds recorded from uh, a different kind of cafe environment, like a coffee shop environment. And they were looking at creativity in this case. Um, one of my former students, Emily Nielsen, uh, carried out a similar experiment where we tried to do everything within the lab. Uh, so people sat in our lab in groups of two or three, um, and they listened on headphones to one of these, uh, I think you can get this on YouTube, but there's also an app for it. Do you know these kinds of sites where you can listen to essentially ambient coffee house, coffee shop sounds, like a restaurant? They're kind of nice, actually. I mean, it is kind of a nice vibe. Sometimes you don't want to actually go to a coffee place, but you just want to have some kind of distraction. Uh, and this is a way that can distract you from being distracted. Uh, it's enough sound to uh, distract out things that would otherwise draw your attention, uh, which lets you focus on what you want to do. And many people like to work that way or uh, read that way. So this is focusing specifically on the sound. Um, so we use this particular one, coffee-tivity. The idea is it makes it sound like a coffee house and it increases productivity. It doesn't really increase productivity. It doesn't really sound like a coffee house, but it's a good ambient sound. So you put the headphones on, uh, it induces a specific feeling. Uh, and then we ask people to solve easy, medium, or difficult remote associate tasks where they're given a series of items and a solution. So basket, eight, and snow, the answer is ball. That's pretty easy. Um, whereas wise worker and tower, uh, the um, answer is clock. Uh, it's more difficult because you have to think of clock wise. Um, you have to think of clockwork and a clock tower, uh, not as straightforward as uh, basketball, eight ball and snowball. The difficulty level has to do with the way in which the word modifies, but also the frequency of the combina combination words. Um, this particular task has been normed fairly well. So people listened to either ambient noise, uh, music, or no noise in this experiment. Yes. We're off topic, but what is crabgrass or grass crab? Crabgrass is a kind of grass that is very difficult to exterminate uh, in, your, in your lawn. So crabgrass, if you've ever seen it, and you've probably seen it, uh, even if you don't know the name, if you get a normal suburban lawn, right? It's like short green grass, but then every so often you see these things that are kind of a paler green and they spread out sort of, they look like flattened grass. Uh, do a Google image search on crabgrass and you'll probably recognize crabgrass. Um, you, the only way to get rid of them is to dig them out if you don't want them in your yard because they'll eventually take over. Um, and they're of course not susceptible to other kinds of broadleaf herbicides because they're also grass. So you don't want to kill all your grass. You just don't want the crabgrass because it's kind of it's kind of ugly uh, <laughs> as grass goes. It sort of flattens out and you can't mow it and that sort of thing. So it's a perfectly, I don't mean to be disparaging about crabgrass as a plant. It's just that most people who want to maintain a, a lawn would not want to have. Okay, so easy, medium, and difficult. And that's a good example there because these are just less familiar terms, right? Uh, everyone knows basketball, not everyone knows crabgrass. Uh, or a king crab, which is a large kind of uh, crab. Uh, we also gave them insight problems. Uh, so there's a town in Northern Ontario where 5% of all the people living in a town have unlisted phone numbers. If you selected 100 names at random from the town's phone directory on average, how many of these people selected would have an unlisted phone number? The answer is, none, right? Because it's unlisted. You couldn't have picked them from the phone directory. Uh, so it's an insight problem and it requires you to think a little bit outside uh, the norm. So you need to not pay attention to the uh, surface uh, details. Solution zero. Um, oh, I seem to be missing uh, the... Am I missing my final slide here? I had a final slide that was supposed to show our results and it looks like I just left that off. I'll put that on in the actual, um, uh, I'll, I'll re-upload the slides at the end. The results that we found, by the way, um, is that participants in this condition, when they were asked 
to do this while they were listening to ambient coffee shop sounds solved more of these hard difficulty items. In other words, they showed that same kind of effect uh, that um, Mark Menadal was showing with the regulatory fit condition. They seemed to perform a little bit better, but in this case, they weren't put into a regulatory fit condition. They were put into an ambient noise condition. The ambient noise seemed to encourage a little bit more cre uh, cognitive flexibility and therefore a little bit more uh, creativity uh, in, in their behaviors. And there should have been a final slide uh, which showed that, but it looks like I left that off inadvertently. I apologize for that. I'll re-upload the final slides when I get back to my office. Okay, 12-12, that actually wasn't bad. Um, are there any questions on this? Or is everybody, everybody feeling pretty good? Yeah. But I was just wondering, quiz today, is it on last week in the week? Yes. Yes, it'll be on unit six, which is induction, and units and week seven, which was causal and deductive reasoning. So only two topics on the quiz, induction and deduction. So those previous two things, same format, otherwise multiple choice, open book, uh, and it's open until nine o'clock. I think there's 15 minutes uh, to take the, take the quiz. All right, have a good week, everyone. Uh, see you next week. We only got, I think we got three classes left too. Is that right? We're nearing the end. Good job, everyone.